fascinates me, always has. I'll never forget the first time I saw the ocean. I was in boot camp, and I looked over, and I saw the bay, and I knew that was the ocean. And it's amazing at the feeling you get for something like that. Turn the book of Galatians with me tonight, please. Galatians chapter number 1 and, and verse 1. All right. Paul, an apostle, note carefully this qualification. This is his qualification. Not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ yes. and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Father, bless your holy word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul was a very controversial figure, to say the least. He was not one of the twelve, and he was a persecutor of the church, therefore he had quite a reputation. At first, when he was saved, they didn't want to receive him. Barnabas is the one who stood by his side and allowed him to be accepted by the brethren in, uh, in Jerusalem. When the Apostle Paul was saved, there was no written scripture. The first book of the New Testament that is written, the first written book, some say is First Thessalonians. But you get different uh, chronologies from different people. I don't really believe that that's all that important. They say that Galatians uh, is written about 60, 70 A.D., somewhere along in there. First book about 50 A.D. And this is about 20 years or so after the death of the Lord Jesus. So for a span of time there, for quite a while, None of the believers had scriptures in their hands to know written scripture. So what did they do? They depended entirely upon the apostles, the apostles in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the, was the fountainhead. It was the foundation. It was the, it was the heart and soul of the Christian faith. Whatever came out of Jerusalem would be what the believers believed. Now the apostle Paul here, Saul of Tarsus, was from Tarsus. And Tarsus is a city in Cilicia. It's part of modern-day Turkey. Tarsus has probably three million-plus people. We don't hear much about that in this country because it's so far away. But that will swallow Knoxville up quite a few times. Three million people in Tarsus. It's still there, just like Damascus and the, and the street called Strait uh, that was there 2,000 years ago. It's still there. And the people in Tarsus are proud of the fact that Paul the Apostle came from there. Uh, Tarsus, of course, is located in what we would call Hellenism, or the Greek culture. And this is where he came from. The Apostle Paul was educated at the feet of Gamaliel, or Gamaliel, however you want to pronounce it. Gamaliel was what we call a sage. He's like Menachem Sneerson. He's like Mamonides. He's like different Jewish, uh, Jewish intellectuals down through the years that had a following. And we have to this day, for example, as I mentioned, Menachem Sneerson. He passed on a few years back, but while he was here... He had gathered quite a following, tens of thousands of people, and many of them thought he was the Messiah. And you say, well, wait a minute, I thought the Messiah was the Son of God. Yes, he is. But in the Old Testament, the, the, the Messiah, the preparation for the Messiah, the prophecy of the Messiah, 2,000 years ago when he showed up, they didn't connect that with the Son of God. He could be the Messiah and not necessarily be the Son of God. The Mashiach in Hebrew, the Messiah, means the anointed one. And the Apostle Peter talks about him, and he says plainly that there's two separate stages to the coming of the Messiah. First is suffering, and then in reigning. He'll come in power and glory. So when the Apostle showed up here, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, his, his conversion, was on the road to Damascus. And he wasn't converted by any of the people in Jerusalem, none of the services that they held, nothing that, was, that happened in Jerusalem, no, no sign of approval. His conversion was entirely separate or distinct from. And he was headed to Damascus. And Damascus is one of the ten cities called the Decapolis. Deca in, in, uh, in Greek is ten. Polis means city, city-state. So it's the ten cities. This is Galilee. This is the area around the Sea of Galilee. And when the Lord Jesus Christ called his disciples, he didn't call them from Jerusalem. He called them from Galilee. And the reason, there's a lot of reasons, but I think one of the main reasons is that they weren't so set in, their, in, in, in Jewish tradition and that he was able to preach to them and for them to understand that, that Jerusalem is holy, but he is holier. <laughs> yes, it's no, holiness now is no longer a place. Holiness is a person. 
And that's what's important to understand. Holiness is not a place. Holiness is a person. So the book of Galatians is written by a man, and they question his credentials. You read about that in 1 Corinthians, and you can read about it uh, here in the book of Galatians, questioning his credentials. Who is this guy? He wasn't one of the twelve. He wasn't one of the apostles in Jerusalem. So who does he think he is uh, telling people uh, what it takes to be saved? If you remember reading Galatians, right after he was saved, he was carried into Arabia. And while he was in Arabia, no doubt it was there that he began to receive the great mysteries of what we call the mysteries of the church of God. The understanding of the body of Christ and the mystery of salvation, the mystery of the grace of God, the mystery of the rapture, the mystery of the, uh, of the body of Christ, and uh, all of that. He received that directly from God. He didn't get it from the, from the teachers in Jerusalem. So you, you can imagine they were a little skeptical of him. They weren't too sure how they were going to take him. So as the early church had no written scriptures, no written scriptures, how do we deal with Gentiles? How do we deal with people who, who, are, who are not Jews? Because to many of them, as, as, as uh, Peter said to the Lord, when the Lord said, I want you to go, I want you to go preach to Cornelius. And, and Peter said, no, wait a minute. Are you sure I'm talking to the Lord? Uh, I've never entered into the house of an unclean Gentile. It's obvious that Peter didn't have evangelizing on his head, on his mind, did he? No, he wasn't ready to go out and preach to the Gentiles. They never understood it to be that until the Apostle Paul made it perfectly clear to them. Uh, and the book of Acts tells you about it, how that the gospel was to be carried to the Gentile also. The last chapter of the book of Acts, the Apostle Peter Apostle John, Paul, Paul talks to the Jews. Some received the word of God, he said, and some didn't. And Paul said it's rightfully so that this should be so to fulfill Isaiah chapter 6. Some believed and some did not. He said, you've made your choice. Now I go unto the Gentiles. And that's a very important point because that's where we are tonight. We are product of the Apostle Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. He, his ministry was to the uncircumcised. That's where Paul was sent. Christ was a minister to the circumcised, which differentiated between the two. It's important to understand this. So the question, the early, the authority of the, of, uh, of the Apostle Paul, the book of Acts chapter 15 is a good example of what I'm talking about because they question uh, whether a Gentile uh, could be saved unless he kept the Sabbath and was and was uh, circumcised and so forth. They had uh, Judaizers that added all of that. And the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, they hammered it out and got it settled that all they had to do is abstain from meats offered to idols and so forth, and they, and they would be accepted into the body of Christ. And Acts chapter number 10, as I told you about how that Peter was confronted. Look at Acts chapter 18, verse 24. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now let's stop for just a moment. Alexandria, Egypt, was the northern part of the Egyptian, uh, con of, the, of the African continent. And Alexandria, as you know, was a place of learning. And it was there that, uh, that, uh, uh, the, that, the, that the, the, the uh, allegorical method and of uh, interpreting scripture came from. It was born in Alexandria and it spread its tentacles on out. Philo of Alexandria was a Jew who tried to take the Old Testament and kind of blend it with, with, uh, with a Gnosticism and, and, uh, and, you know, the allegorical method. And so this man, Apollos, came from Alexandria, and, but he was mighty in the scriptures and he came to Ephesus. And this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. But note carefully, knowing only the baptism of John. It's a, you, you need to understand that we're in a transition period. This is very important. That when, uh, when the apostle Peter stood back in Acts chapter number 2, he said, Ye men of Israel. He's not even preaching to the church. He said, Ye men of Israel. And, of course, he brought the message from the book of Joel, chapter number 2. You've got to be careful where you reach and cherry-pick scriptures and put together some kind of a system so that you can get people into the kingdom of God. There is no system in here. Salvation's a person, not a system. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So what we have here is a conflict. We have a confrontation between Hellenism, or a Greek culture, Greek gods, and the whole like, how many of you know what was on top of, of, uh, of the Acropolis in, Rome, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Athens, Greece? 
The Acropolis means the highest point of the city. Police, Acropolis. What was up there? There was a Parthenon, a place of worship to the Virgin. Go down here to Nashville, Tennessee, to Centennial Park, and walk in that place, and you're looking at an exact reproduction of what that uh, temple looked like 2,000 years ago. So this is the Greek culture. I mean, you can get into all the fertility rites and all of the gods and the goddesses and the whole nine yards. Here's the problem. All of this was brought into the Decapolis, into the ten cities of the north. You had this Greek culture. So there's a conflict that takes place. And this is another reason for the people in Jerusalem to be wary of the Apostle Paul because he didn't come from them. He came from Greek culture, although he was a very learned man. If you'll notice what it says in the book of Galatians, not Galatians, but the book of Acts, here's what Paul said about himself. Acts chapter number 22 and verse 3. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye are, as you all are this day. Now, you do a little research on Gamaliel, you'll find out he's the grandson of Hillel. And you'll find out that his branch of theology was more liberal than the other. How do you know that? Look what the book of Acts says about him. Acts chapter 5, verse 34. Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 34. Acts chapter 5, verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. You all remember where the Pharisees started, don't you? They started in Babylon during the captivity. Named Gamaliel. They were the keepers of the law. They were the observers to make sure it was kept. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people. He was not only a rabbi, he was a rabban. He was one of those who, were, who, who was unquestioned. If he said something, he was such a scholar, they accepted what he had to say. Now remember... Paul sat at his feet. He was his instructor. So it says here in verse 34, there stood up one the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, said to them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do is touching these men. That's a reasoned man. See? It's not saying that he believes any of the gospel, but he's a reasoned man. He's the kind of man that you can reason with. He'll sit down and you sit down and two of you can talk. You can have a dialogue with a man like this. This mob that's out here in the streets now, there's no dialogue. You see, there's one way, their way, and if you don't agree with them, you'll get called everything under the sun. Out the, out the door with freedom of speech. Told you before. Once you lose the freedom of speech, you've lost all the rest of them. Freedom of speech is a precious gift indeed. Now here's the doctor of the law. He said, be careful what you do with these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves. In other words, he may have said he was a Messiah. Here we have another one. And the problem is the Jews have been plagued with messiahs down through the centuries. As I told you a moment ago, even now in the present day, there are those who think that what they have messiahs. The Thutis, bo boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, 400, joined themselves who was slain. And all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. Plainer words, nothing but empty boast. He was a dead end. Now this man remembers that. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee. Here we come from the Decapolis. Remember the ten cities in the north that are Greek in culture, that conflict because they had, they had Jews there also. Remember Peter's home. Where was Peter's home? Where was his mother-in-law? I mean, his, his, yeah, his mother-in-law. What, what do you have to do to have a mother-in-law? You've got to get married. <laughs> well, Peter was the first pope, right? So he was a married pope. <laughs> And no need getting all that. But I mean, he was married. 
After this rose up Judas of Galilee. Well, the city I'm thinking about, what's the name of the town where his, his mother-in-law? Capernaum. Capernaum. You get that from the Old Testament. This man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing. And it's, it's an amazing thing how they never forget the days of the taxing. You will remember them. The days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say to you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel of this work be of men, it will come to naught. Now you watch it. You watch what's happening now. You watch it. Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nothing will bring down the church. Amen. Nothing. His church will be here. Now he may bring down apostasy and apostate churches. But I'm talking about the body of Christ. You set yourself up an enemy to it and try to destroy it, and it will destroy you. But anyway, he said, now I say to you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. Now here's a reasonable man. He's saying, I don't understand all that's going on with these Christians, these Messianic Jews, whatever you want to call them. They, they believe in a Jew, and this Jew is supposed to be their Messiah. This Jew, they say, is the Son of God. This Jew died on a cross and was buried. They say he rose from the dead. You know, all of this. I'm sure he was thinking about all of that. But he said, be careful what you do with them. You know, it's good to have reasonable men. It really is. It's a blessing to be able to sit down and have dialogue. I've told you before, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with dialogue. Nothing. Nothing at all. If you can't defend your position, you have no position. You see what I mean? So the, uh, he said, you'll be fighting you, lest you fight against God. And to him they agreed. To him they agreed. And when they'd called the apostles and beaten them, must be, they had their own agenda. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, do you think they're going to stop them by beating them? No, 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 no. Who was it preached about the gate called call beautiful the other day? Brother Yates? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter said that. There's power there. They're not going to stop it. They're not going to stop it. Let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be beaten, <laughs> to suffer shame for his name. And thus they become part of a long, long list of martyrs and people who have suffered for the name of Christ and still are. At this moment right now all over this world, they're being persecuted and they're being killed believers in Christ, your brothers and your sisters that you've never seen on this earth, but you will see them. I believe there will be a special time when the martyrs present themselves before the Lord. I do. All of the ages, all the people from all the ages, they'll be there, but there will be the martyrs. Probably the first group will be those that were burned by Nero to light up his orgies. And those who were burned in the Colosseum. That's a famous painting. I don't know who painted it back in the 1800s, I believe. Shows these lions coming up out of the, out of underneath, there in the Colosseum, and it shows uh, uh, crucifixes all around and people on them, and they're being burned. Then there's a little crowd, little group of Christians over here, and there's an old man that's the leader, and these lions are headed for these Christians. This is this is where we came from. This is our heritage. Our heritage runs deep. Amen. You understand? You can come up with some novel political movement or whatever you please, but it'll pass away. But our heritage runs long and deep, and we know where we came from. Amen. You know about the catacombs under Rome. They went in there and they met there. They drew, uh, they drew pictures on the wall. They met there because they were being persecuted. They wouldn't stop. You can't stop them. You can't stop them man wrote a treatise and he says that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that's a good thought. Think about it. Like I say, we have, we have a long list 
of those who've died for Christ and are still dying for him. These are rejoicing because they had been beaten for the name of Christ. Now, in Acts chapter 5, verse 28, I want you to notice how the human mind goes. The human mind. Watch how people justify themselves. This is a prime example. Acts 5, 28. You talk about hypocrisy. You're going to read about it right here. This is some of the worst hypocrisy in the Bible. Now look at it. Saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? Don't you teach in this name. Notice he couldn't even, they couldn't even call him the Lord Jesus. <laughs> this name. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us? Wait just a minute. Turn to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 25. Matthew 27, 25. You intend to bring this man's blood on us? Seems like I read something over here about that. Matthew 27, 25. Then answered the people, His blood be on us and on our children. Who they say that to? Pilate. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Pilate was a secular authority, the authority of Rome, who couldn't have cared less who their Messiah, something had to do with Moses' law or anything. They didn't care anything about that. They wanted the Pax Romana. They wanted the peace of Rome. That's all that mattered. And so when Pilate saw that he prevailed nothing but that a rather tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. He's got a conscience. Then answered all the people and said, notice how the mob gets mobbed together. His blood be on us and on our children. Now, these, these people over here in the book of Acts says, what are you trying to do, bring his blood on us? Look at Matthew 27 and verse number 4. Matthew 27, verse number 4. Judas, verse 3, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See thou to it. In plain words, we don't care if it's innocent or not. We have an agenda. But this is quite a revelation from Judas. This is a powerful statement. The innocent blood that's never said of any soul on this earth but him. Over there in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians when it talks about the blood of Abel, the righteous blood of Abel, also the book of Hebrews, crying out, crying out. And God said, the voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? So he says here, this innocent blood. The blood's the bloodline. The blood's the line of prophecy. The bloodline is what started in Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. This is why Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Tanim was the name that had to do with his perfect in his generations. Noah was a pure human being that could trace his lineage all the way back to Adam. That's why. That's right. In other words, God was going to preserve through Noah from one end of the flood to the other, from the old world into the new world, the bloodline of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. He would not make a new man from the dirt of the ground. He, he preserved the bloodline. And when you turn over here to the book of Matthew chapter number 1, look at it. Matthew 1. Matthew the publican, remember him? Levi, tax collector. You ever notice anybody that has anything to do with taxes? They're just not liked very much. <laughs> the tax man cometh. <laughs> the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. All right. The son of who? When did David live? Just generally. That's right. I heard somebody say 1000 B.C. That's correct. 
Now, what about Abraham? When did he live? 1900 B.C. 900 years between the two. You'd think that Abraham would come before David, wouldn't you? It doesn't have anything to do with that. This is the bloodline. This is the monarchy. This is the king. This is the blood. This is the innocent blood that cries from the ground. I have betrayed the innocent blood. Judas is saying, is saying I have betrayed the bloodline. The innocent one in the bloodline. Innocent. Judas is saying he's innocent. But you know people in the pulpits all over this country and all over the world, they never give Christ near as much glory as Judas did. They didn't. We got demons around, run around 2,000 years ago. They told more truth about Christ than you'll hear from some of these liberal churches. We know who thou art. Thou art the Holy One of God. You know who said that? Demons. <laughs> they know who he is in the spirit world. He's the Son of God, folks. Now, this book of Galatians, why did he write it? He wrote it because, according to Acts chapter 15, when they tried to infiltrate Judaism, Judaizers, into the body of Christ, the conflict started, didn't end. So the apostle wrote a book to these people in Galatia. And I'm just going to scratch around a little bit on the surface of it, but the purpose of the book is to show them salvation is not through Judaism. Keeping or not keeping the law. Salvation is by grace through faith in a person. And then he gets into the argument about it, how he compares the promise made to Abraham and all of that. And that's later on down the road. That's not what we deal with tonight. Salvation is what we're talking about in the book of Galatians. What must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer said, Acts chapter 16. What must I do to be saved? Somebody said, well, all he cared about was his, his hide. I mean, after all, they would kill the, 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 uh, the guards if something happened. The Bible said God shook the earth. And the apostle Peter, bless his heart, after the earth was shaken and the gates flung open wide, just laying there sleeping up a storm, didn't bother him a bit. That's a man who's got peace with God. So what did he say to him? How do you get saved? What did he say? What did he say to him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, if you 1 Corinthians 15, I want to show you something else. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. If you have trouble snoring, get you a CPAP. <laughs> How many have CPAP in here? I'm telling you right now, but it'll, you'll never snore again if you've got a CPAP. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren. Now look at this carefully. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you believe, wherein you stand. By which also you are what? Saved. Saved. If you keep in memory what I preached to you, lest you have believed in vain. Now, let's stop for just a moment. There's not a word here telling them what to do. What he's telling them is what they need to believe. A situation of facts. What do you believe? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. If you believe that, turn to Romans 10. And somebody say one time, said, Preacher, I got saved by going down the Romans road. Good. God bless you. Amen. But you can be saved by going down the Galatians road too. You see. Or the First Corinthians road. See, here's the thing. All Scripture, all salvation in the Scripture, everything that has to do with righteousness in God, eventually leads to the Lord Jesus Christ. In, for, in Romans chapter number 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Be saved. Notice it doesn't get into all that, that, uh, that the apostle laid out in 1 Corinthians 15. Why, preacher? Because the condition of your heart is what matters. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to be saved. 
Now, in Romans 10, it's a beautiful thing here. It really is. I mean, you've seen this before. Uh, Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 15. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that, that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now you read that peace. Well, then all I have to do is go out and tell people peace, have peace. No, what you need to do is read the Bible. Verse 16, but they've not all obeyed. For Esaias, this is Elijah, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There's the element right there, faith. Now look at verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their worlds, words unto the ends of the world. What's he quoting? He's quoting an Old Testament text that says, look up. You see those stars? Somebody made them. Look up. There's a message in them. Before the Bible was ever written, men were already looking up because there was a message carried across from the flood, from the old world into the new world. And that truth was handed down to Abraham. Abraham is at the time of Nimrod. Abraham carried the truth. God said of Abraham, he said, I know him. I know him. He will direct his house. So Abraham is set directly opposite of Nimrod. Nimrod is the religion of Babylon. Nimrod's religion, walk out that door right there. You're in his home. That's Nimrod right out there. He's a type of the Antichrist. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. God did not write the Bible to confuse you. He didn't write it to trick you. How, how to be saved is the most important thing you'll ever know in this world. Wouldn't it be a shame? I mean, you spend all your life, and maybe even go out soul winning. You know that John Wesley came over here to get the Indians saved. He came from England to get the Indians saved. Turned around, headed back to England, found out he was lost himself. That's right. And I think he found this out through Moravians. I believe there were, were Moravians on board that ship. And they led him to Christ. They led him to the Lord. Wesley came over here as a good hard worker, establishing righteousness, seeking the way of the Lord, doing the right thing. But in his heart, he had never received the Son. He had never received him into his heart. Once a person really gets hold of the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart, they immediately give up on themselves. For our righteousness is a filthy rag compared to his. So we give up on our righteousness right off the bat. And we realize that it is by faith we trust Christ. That's what I say to you tonight. Maybe somebody prayed through as they say. Maybe somebody had hands laid on them. Maybe somebody had, a, had an experience. They were in the Holy Land or maybe they were alone reading the Bible. Maybe they answered the altar call during a church service. It's un, you know, unlimited number of scenarios. That's not what counts. What counts is whether you can receive into your heart the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may not have all your doctrine right. You may not have it all right. You may be old amillennial. You may be postmillennial. Your, your liturgy may be different from somebody else's liturgy. The way you worship, what kind of service you have. But do you have the Son of God in your heart? Once you have him in your heart, you will have brothers and sisters that draw near to you and you to them because you'll have that witness of the Holy Spirit of God. And you know it. Once the Holy Ghost comes into your soul, there are things you never have to tell a Christian because the Holy One is living inside them. And that is the measure of whether they've been born again or not. Amen. 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 You don't have to... Holy Spirit will let you know if something's wrong. He'll let you know real fast. So, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? I got saved in the living room, bowed my head. 1973, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I've told you a thousand times, but I'll tell you another thousand. Because it was so profound. I bowed my head as a sinner. God knows what kind of a wicked life I'd lived. 
bowed my head right there in that living room because I was under such conviction I wanted to die. And when I raised my head back up, man, something flooded into my soul that was not there before. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you can't get religious people to understand that. You can't. You can't. They always fall back on what they've done or what church they belong to or how wonderful their pastor is or how much they've done for the Lord. All these things uh, have their place, no question about all that. But that's not what's important. The important thing is, do you have him? Do you have him? Do you have him? Father, in thy name I pray. Lord, this thing with the Apostle Paul, the confrontation he had, and then what he began to teach after that, I pray you'd open that up for us. I pray you'd show us. But tonight, Lord, in our heart, our heart, not the fellow next to us. We don't, our salvation has nothing to do with his. Our heart. What do we believe in our heart? Who has moved into our life? Yeah, I don't understand tonight how in the world that you could move into somebody's life and they not know it. In Jesus' name. But your heads are bowed. Nobody's looking. Anybody likes me to pray for you tonight and say, Preacher, just pray for me because I don't know. I'm... I'm in, I'm out, I'm up, I'm down. Sometimes I'm a strong believer, I think, and at other times it seems like I just can't believe anything. I'm here, they're there, I'm double-minded. And uh, pray, pray for me. I will. I will. Because that's most of the time it's not what people choose to be like that. You make choices that get you like that, but you didn't choose to just get in the mess you're in. The choices you made got you in the mess you're in. Anybody? Say, Lord Jesus, say, Lord Jesus, I want you in my heart. Tired of playing games. Tired of being religious. I want you in my heart. Don't let your pride get between you and the Lord. Because it will be the first thing to raise its head up. Pride. What do people think about me? I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a preacher. I'm a missionary. What in the world, preacher? Why, if I got saved, all these people would lose hope. But no, if you got saved, you would spark a revival in those people that have been watching you. And the power of God began to move. Any of you? Father, I pray for every soul in the house tonight. Pray for them. Lord, I ministered your word and love you. Love your word, this blessed book. I pray now that the word would not return void. It will accomplish that which you please. It will prosper in the thing until you've sent it. In your holy name I pray. Amen, 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 amen. Saul of Tarsus.